I want to talk to you, and, and you don't need your Bible, Furch, because <laughs> this is Friendship Sunday, and, and we're, we've invited people to come to the next service, and I'm assuming they won't bring Bibles. So I was like, okay, we'll break them in the following week when they come back. So I wanted, and since it was Friendship Sunday, I thought I would do a sermon on friendship. Um, I've always been fascinated by friendships, maybe because um, there was a point in my life I thought I had a ton of friends. And then some scenarios happened in my life, and you find out, when you go through tough times, you find out how many real friends you actually have. And ever since then, I've read lots of books. I probably have this many books just on friendship. I have one book that's this thick. It's, it's written by a Jewish guy that is examining friendships. And it's so actually rare and unique. How many of you have, you've tried to be a friend to someone else, but they have not returned the friendship towards you? Have you ever had someone like that? All right. I assume all of us have. And I want you to keep that in mind. So it turns out that most people do not have very many friends. And in fact, most studies show that you have probably the most friends from high school and college. But after age 25, you continue to lose friends steadily for the rest of your lives. And it is a high number. I don't know. I, I think it's close to 50% of men wind up with zero friends as they get older. They lose friends quicker than women do, but um, many people wind up with zero friends at the end of their life. And there's different reasons why that happens. Most people today have just accepted the fact that you live your life on earth without friends. So it's really weird what, where everyone's going towards. And I was reading studies that robots we're all going to wind up having robots in our houses, and they will be our friends. And they're saying people adjust to robots very easily to become your best friend. I'm like, whoa. But the reason why we have less and less friends is, I, I was thinking there's less social interaction. Like, you know, everything, roller skating's going down, bowling's going down, golf is going down, all the things, church attendance, you know, all the things you used to do together is, is going away as people stay at home and on the internet and doing less and less interaction. People are moving around with jobs more than ever. How many of you have had uh, five jobs? So, how many are working the same job? Like you got out of college and you're at the same job. Through your, yeah, see, so strength. Do you work for the state? No. Don, you work for the state. <laughs> Yeah, that's the only ones that have the same job, state, state workers. So, um, in the old days, you used to get out of college, get, go into some company, and you stayed in that company for, you know, 35 years and retired. But today, I mean, people are like changing jobs. And in the old days, you used to buy a house, and you stayed in that house, no matter how big it was, you stayed in that house your whole life. Where today, like, we move, we... We want bigger homes, we're changing, and it's constantly breaking up our friendship. So, and there's not as much real connections. I, I often laugh that I have a thousand Facebook friends, and I feel bad because if I actually see some of those Facebook friends in real life, I'm like, uh-oh, what's her name? I, I, know, I know they're a Facebook friend with me, but I, you know... And so we fool ourselves into thinking we have lots of friends. This older couple, they were discussing their funeral arrangement. And one of the things they had to fill out on the funeral arrangement paper is, who will be your six pallbearers? And she says to her husband, I don't even think you have six friends or relatives that can be your ball, ball, ball bearers? Ball bearers. We do... You, you would not realize this, but the pastors in this church, we do lots of funerals. So funeral homes call us up and say, hey, a family has lost a loved one and they don't have any church home. Would you be willing to come do the funeral? 
And it is so sad when we do some of these funerals that literally they have three people there. Or, I mean, there's no one, you know, it's the lawyer, the doctor, and, you know, the one relative. So it, it's, it's amazing how people lose their friends. Loneliness accelerates age-related declines in cognitive and motor function. There's all kinds of studies that show that if you have friends, you will live on average 10 years longer than the people who do not have friends. And with illness, 2010 study published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology that looked at thousands of cancer patients, social well-being, including friendship, turned out to be the number one predictor of survival. So if people have friends, for whatever reason, it gives them a, it builds up their immune system and they're more likely to survive cancer than if they do not have friends. Definition of friendship. And I like this one. Almost in every book, the definition of friendship is very similar to this. Um, this is about David and Jonathan. They were very, two good friends. Uh, it says that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul, 1 Samuel 18.1. So we're made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And you can, you can be friends in any one of those three, or two of those three, or three of those three areas. But a basic friendship is when your soul connects to another person's soul. And your soul would be your emotions, your character, what you like, your hobbies, your interests, your job. And so if you connect with another person, you both have the same interests and, and you both have the same sense of humor and you have the same interests. And, and so your souls can knit together and that can become a good soul friend. But then you can have a spiritual friendship with someone. And I know this sounds weird, but you can have a spiritual friendship with someone and not have a soul friendship, okay? So there, it, you can have a very powerful friend if you have both a soul connection and a spiritual connection, which I believe only believers can actually have this level of spiritual connection around Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says that outside of Jesus, a person's spirit is actually dead. So you can only have a soul connection or a physical connection, but not a spiritual connection. And then, of course, the third connection you can have is the connection that hopefully married people have, which is the physical connection, where you physically are knit together. Um, and obviously, not every marriage, so most marriages can have the physical connection. Some marriages will have the spiritual connection, but some do not just depends if they both love the Lord and have made Jesus, you know, primary in their life. And a lot of married people don't have a soul connection. They're actually not best friends. And that's why 50% to 60% of marriages will end in divorce, and about another 30% will just tolerate each other in the same home. But they actually don't have a soul connection or a spirit connection. The strongest marriage is, needless to say, when you're married to your best friend and you have a soul connection, a spiritual connection, and a physical connection, that makes for the strongest marriage and the strongest friendship. So what do people look for in friends? Every study, there's basically three things we look for in our friends, and the first one is loyalty. In Proverbs, says, many a man claims to have unfailing love, but a faithful man who can find. So the Lord says, lots of people claim they will be faithful to their friends. But God says, uh, how many faithful people are there really? I, I mean, I know everyone when they get married claims they will be loyal to the one they're in love with for the rest of their lives, and uh, 50, 60% of them, it doesn't even last that long. So that's why the Lord says, yeah, lots of people say that, but very few are really loyal. A friend loves at all times. Do not forsake your friend and the friend of your father. And if a man denounces, in Job, this is, if a man denounces his friends for reward, the eyes of his children will fail. Interesting verse. 
So loyalty, it's the first thing. Are people loyal? Are they gonna stick with us? They're not good weathered friends. Second, we look for friends that will accept us for who we are, so we can be ourselves around. Um, turns out I was reading this study that if you have friends that nitpick you, if you have friends that are constantly pointing out your negative and you know, you didn't do this right, you didn't say that right, guess how many friends that person will wind up with? Zero. Yeah, you should read the studies. So I, I have this baloney and amazing. This, this one guy, anytime he heard something that he didn't like or, you know, didn't believe that someone would say, he would go baloney, baloney. And he, and he wound up with no friends. And so he changed that to amazing. <laughs> So every time he would hear stuff, whether he agreed with it or not, he would just go, that's amazing, wow, wow that's, that's, and he wound up with more friends than he knew what to do with, so. But you wanna be, you wanna be with people, you can be yourself, and you know, that you don't feel you're on the spot, or you can't be the true you, then, then you don't have a friendship, you have a fake something, but it's, it's not a real friendship. And I realize you, I'll get to well, what happens if your friend really is doing something, wrong. I'll, I'll get to that in a second here. Third, we look for people that we can confide in. He who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. So we always look for people that we can confide in and won't tell other people. And I've, I've, I think I've coined this. I call it, so I, I think I'm making friends with someone and I tell them something personal. I call it the knife of truth. It, it would hurt if they told other people. It could, you know, mess me up if they shared it. So I call it a knife of truth. And then you find out over time when the opportunity arises, do they stick that knife in your back or do they, as it says here, love covers over the offense. Do they just, you know what, even though I know that about Joe, my love covers it over and I would never use it to stab him in the back. And, you, and the Lord will bring things around to reveal your true friends or the friends that will betray you. Toxic friends. There are six things that can destroy friendship. So the first one is envy and competition. So sometimes friends get into competition with one another. I bought a new car. So your friend has to go and buy a better car. And I got a new home, and your friend gets a, you know, a bigger home. And I got a raise at my job, and I got a bigger raise at my job. And, you know, you kind of feel like back in high school or something, or college, like you, you feel like you're in competition. And that ultimately will destroy the friendship, especially if you're like the one that you always get, you know, <laughs> something happens to you, and your friend then has to copy you and, and up you one. The other thing is envy, when you envy your friends. And this is, this is the interesting part of this, that 90% of friends can mourn with you when you mourn. So if you're going, if you lose your job, your friend cries with you. Oh, I'm so sorry you lost your job. Or your kids are going through a tough time. Your marriage is, you know, going through a rough spat with your spouse. And, your friends, 90% of your friends will be able to weep and mourn with you and feel, yeah, I get your pain, I understand, and all that stuff. The, the problem is that only about 10% of friends can rejoice with you when something good happens in your life. So you share with your friend, I just got a promotion and got a $50,000 raise. Only about 10% of us can go, Man, that is so exciting. I just, you, you deserve it. You, it couldn't happen to a better person. And I just want to rejoice. Why don't you treat us for dinner now? So um, only about 10% can really rejoice in good news with another person in, in their life. So I, I always have remembered that. And I do. I, I, I on purpose, when friends tell me good things that happen in their life, you know, I, Often I, I just don't want to say anything, and I go, wait a second, that's right. Most people, 90% of people can never rejoice. 
So I'm not, I'm going to be like, you know, <laughs> that is amazing. That is great. I, I couldn't happen to a better person. And I'm just so happy for you. Money. So if you want your friend to have memory problems, loan them money. So <laughs> Proverbs 19. Let's see, verse 4. Wealth attracts many friends. It, it does, but I don't know if they're real friends or not. But, it, so, but even the closest friend of the poor person deserts them. The poor are shunned by all their relatives. And you know why they're shunned by all their relatives? Because they're always asking for money, right? How much more do their friends avoid them? Though the poor pursue them with pleading, they are nowhere to be found. So the, the problem when you lend money to a friend is, as it says in Proverbs, you change the relationship that the borrower is servant to the lender. So as soon as you lend money to a friend, you no longer friend friend, but you are master servant. And it changes the relationship. I think one of the toughest things we have, and fortunately none of my kids are here, is some of our kids want to borrow money from us. But we've just made a decision. Now, I'm not telling all of you what to do. <laughs> just for Rob and I, you know we have a lot of kids, so we have to, our kids are very, whatever we do for one, we have to do for all of them. So, but some of our kids have wanted to borrow money from us, and we're like, no, we don't, we don't lend money to you. We helped educate you. You got on your feet, you, you have to do it on your own. <laughs> Go to a bank. But we aren't in the money lending business. And I think it's been very good because we've kept the friendship with our children instead of reverting back to parent-child kind of situation in the old days. So favors, it's when one side of the friendship constantly is taking advantage of the friendship. Dependency, this is when you're overdoing your friendship. So I love this verse, Proverbs 25. I, I have never noticed this until this week. L listen to this. Uh-oh, let me get the right chapter here. All right, 25. If you find honey, eat just enough. Too much of it and you will vomit. Okay, there's... I haven't given you the whole proverb yet. This is just the first half of it. All right? So if you find honey, eat just enough of it. If you eat too much, literally it says you will vomit. Okay? Second half of the proverb. Seldom set foot in your neighbor's house. Too much of you and they will hate you. So, or they'll vomit. So, you have to like eat enough honey don't go overboard. If you have friends, you know, keep, but don't, don't smother your friends. Don't overdo it or they will hate you. Children, I have learned and I am learning <laughs> because we have to learn this with our own kids. Now, Robin and I, this is what I've learned. Keep your mouth shut when you're with friends that are raising their kids, okay? Now, Robin and I, we've perfected childhood. We actually know, after all of our kids, we know exactly how to raise children now. But we have learned that no one wants to listen to us, okay? It's just one of those areas that every parent wants to discover for themselves. And you will. When you're done raising your kids, you'll know the right way to do it, okay? But it'll be too late, all right? So I have just learned, even with... I, when I'm watching our kids raise our grandchildren, I'm like, that's not how we raised you. I mean, or, or, but I'll talk to my wife afterwards and go, maybe were we that way? Is that how we were with our kids and we just don't remember how we were when we were 25 years old? Is our brain going or, you know, but whatever. Again, we're trying to keep the friendship with our children. And so we have learned, keep your mouth shut. Everyone has their own way of raising their children. You want to lose friends real fast, just start telling them what they're doing wrong. All right. And, of course, betrayal. 
This is the only piece of advice I have for making friends. The righteous should choose their friends carefully. And he who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. So it does turn out, every study shows that you actually do become like your friends. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be misled, bad company corrupts good character. So whoever you hang out with, studies show you'll become like the people you hang out with. So that's why I was like, you don't have to actually nitpick your friend because if you hang out with them, you'll become like them and they'll become like you. <laughs> and if you're Christian friends, so you're hanging out with Jesus, Jesus is with you and your friends, well, that's great. He who walks with the wise, if you always have Jesus as one of the friends that you're hanging out with, he who walks with the wise grows wise. The, the Lord will transform you and your other friends as you're walking with Jesus. And so the last couple minutes, I just want to ask, are you a friend with God? Are you a friend of God? James 2.23, as the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's what? Friend. Abraham was called God's friend. And then Exodus, we're going to get to there. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. This verse, I just want you to know that Jesus says to his disciples, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. So I'm probably going to shoot myself in the foot here. But the thought that God wants to be our friend is amazing isn't it really I, I I don't know of any other religion that teaches that God wants to be your friend you know that I grew up in the Catholic Church I never ever got the feeling attending church that God wanted to be my friend in fact it was to me going to church was a very kind of frightening awe you know, God was kind of up there. He would speak through the priest. Um, it was, could be scary. I, but I never, never realized until I got into the scriptures that God's like, I want to be your friend. Don't you think that's amazing? I want to be your best friend. I don't want to call you servants. It, it reminds me of our relationship with our kids. So when we were younger raising our kids, it was, um, you know, parent to child. But now it's friend to friend. And that's where God wants to go with us. I know he's God, and I know we're our kids' parents, but God's like, I, I wanna go another level. I would love to be your friend. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And that friend that sticks closer than a brother, this is about Jesus. So you see, Jesus has those three things. So remember, the first thing we look for is loyalty. Do you think Jesus is loyal when he becomes your friend? He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And do you think Jesus accepts us? It's, it's weird. While we were yet sinners, Christ dies for us. Um, and then we can start this relationship. And he has a way of working with us just at the right pace. And I think what it is, is as we walk with Jesus, you know, he who is wise and you walk with someone wiser, you'll become wiser. So as you walk with Jesus through life, you become more holy. You, you become like your friend, and your best friend is Jesus. And he's someone you can confide in. Like, I never worry. I can talk to Jesus all the time, and I never worry that he's going to spill, you know, 
my guts. I, I know he knows what betrayal is all about because Judas betrayed him. So I know he knows that feeling. And Jesus is like, I'll, I'll never betray you, Joe. I'll never stab you in the back. I'm, I'm a faithful, good friend. But I started out with asking you, have you ever had a friend that you've tried to be friends with someone, but you discovered it's only a one-way friendship? And one-way friendships they're not friendships, okay? And that's the way Jesus is. So Jesus wants to be a friend to all of us. That is, that's in the heart of God from before creation. Like, I, let's have some friends. Let's make people with a free will and let's have some family and let's have some friends. And so Jesus knocks, he the sin separated us from God's friendship, but Jesus paid for our sins so they don't have to separate us from the friendship of God. And Jesus says, I would love to be your friend. And he knocks on the door of your heart, of your life, and says, if you open up the door and say you want to be a friend, I will be happy to come in to be your friend. I would love, to, I'm not... Jesus is not going to force. He could force open the door, but Jesus says, I'm not, that's not the type of God I am. I, I love you. I died for you. I, I want to share my life with you, but all I can do is knock on the door and ask you, would you like to be my friend? And for all those that open up the door, well, you will discover, as I did 42 years ago, that the friend the most amazing friend you will ever meet will enter into your life. And what's so amazing about this friendship is Jesus has truly been amazing for 42 years. He has always stuck closer to me than anyone else. He's been with me through thick and thin, through every issue I've gone through. He has amazing wisdom when I come to him. But even more, I get to spend all eternity with him. He is going to share the universe, the new earth, the new city. Um, I mean, our friendship is going to go on forever. So, are you friends with the Lord Jesus? He's, he knocks on the door of our hearts. And all we have to do is say, Jesus, forgive me. I would love you to be my best friend. So let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes and... It's Friendship Sunday, and I want you to know, Abraham was called the friend of God. Moses talked to the Lord face to face like a man speaks with his friend. Jesus is an amazing friend, knocking on the door of your soul, saying, I would love to be your friend. So if you're here this morning, and you have... I, it's called cosmic loneliness. There's a deep loneliness in your heart because that loneliness can only be met by asking God into your life. And you were created. Adam and Eve were created to have a friendship with God. God walked with them in the garden. God talked with them. And that's the type of relationship God wants to have with you. I'm going to pray a prayer, prayer out loud, and I invite you to pray along with me. And you can ask Jesus to be your friend. I'll pray out loud. You pray silently. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and paying the price for my sin. Jesus, I open my door to my soul. And I ask you to come in to be my best friend, my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your presence. And I thank you for that friendship that I'm starting from this day for all eternity to be with you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I would like to pray a prayer blessing over those of you who prayed that prayer along with me to ask Jesus 
into your heart to be your savior and your best friend. So while every head is bowed and every eye closed and Christian praying, those of you that prayed that prayer, if you just slip your hand up and then after I see it, put it down, say, Pastor, I pray to ask Jesus to be my friend and my savior. Anyone here this morning? God bless you, sister. Anyone else? Just slip your hand up and after I see it, put it down. Anyone else? Father, I, I thank you for this one sister here, and I pray that she would really sense your presence in her life and that you would move upon her, that you would fill her with your Holy Spirit, that you would be an amazing friend to her, her Lord, her Savior, and uh, her best friend. May you guide and direct her paths all the days of her life, here and for all eternity. In your name we pray, amen.